something that you are truly, truly thankful for. And we're going to pause for a moment in our prayer, and I want you to focus on whatever that is. Maybe the first thing, maybe it was the first thing that came to your mind. Maybe it's something recent, or maybe it's been some time. Something you are truly, truly thankful for. Heavenly Father, you are God. And I am just thankful that you are real. That you want to have a relationship with your people. That we can have hope. Not like those who do not have hope because they do not believe in you. May we be thankful. And I know among this crowd here today, we could go around the room and share one blessing or thanksgiving after another. How you have worked in our lives, how you have blessed our lives, both here and for eternity. May we just thank you with a heart of praise. And may we go beyond just using words and sentiment and demonstrate our thankfulness to you by serving you and honoring you and glorifying you in word and in deed. <clears throat> Help us to understand how to become servants for you and to live a life of thanksgiving, glorifying and honoring you by everything we do. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Unfortunately, this world isn't always a fair place and sometimes you need a lawyer. For instance, have you ever been in a situation where you've seen a need and felt compelled to help? Or worse yet, have you ever done a good deed and not been fairly compensated? If the answer is yes to any of these questions, don't hesitate in calling me, Dirk Hardcastle. I'm a lawyer. My office specializes in cases where people have loved other people and have been inconvenienced. My solution, take them to court. Have you ever been nice to someone you didn't feel like being nice to? Not on my watch. Take them to court! Have you ever had to listen to someone share their hopes, dreams, and fears? Cha-ching! Take them to court! There are a lot of people out there who give money to groups and organizations and individuals they care deeply about. But if they would have called me, I would have got all their money back tenfold. Cold hard. I didn't go to eight weeks of online law school so that you would have to love selflessly. My name's Dirk Hardcastle, and if you have to turn the other cheek, you better get paid. I think we'll consider a different idea of service today. And uh, I've already told John they don't get to borrow that from his law firm. <laughs> turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 6. This month we're going to be looking at Christian men on the go. And there's one in particular I'd like to focus on today. His name is Philip. And we sort of have an introduction to him here in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6 verses 1 through 7. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. 
but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. There was much to do in the work of the church. A lot was going on. The apostles were preaching and teaching. And in these earliest days of the church, these earliest days, these earliest weeks and months, the church grew. It says it multiplied. Not just added. But multiplied. And as it grew, there are more and more people becoming part of the body of Christ, which meant there were going to be more and more needs that might need to be met. And an issue arose in the church, an issue which could have been very divisive about the distribution of food or resources uh, to, to various widows in the church. And just as a quick side note, I'd just like to say that very early in the life of the church, we see the church being very concerned for widows. And it's mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament, along with orphans as well. The church should still be concerned for widows and orphans and those among its fellowship who might be in need. And these men were sought out to be godly men to help minister to that need so that the apostles could focus their time on the proclamation and teaching of the word itself. So Philip began his ministry, his service, we see here in the New Testament, with what might be considered by some to be a somewhat menial task. But sometimes those things that we consider to be menial tasks are really not menial at all. They can be very significant as we consider our service to the Lord God. Are we willing to do the same thing? Are we willing to, to serve and to help in what might to us seem to be a menial task in the Lord's service? I hope we would with the realization that it may not be as menial a task as we think. Now one thing uh, I think we can say uh, with some degree of certainty is the issue was solved. This potentially divisive issue was addressed because there's no more mention of it in the church. These men addressed the issue. And must have done a pretty good job. And then after it was over, some of these, if not all of them, began preaching and teaching themselves and becoming evangelists. So turn over just a page or two to Acts chapter 8, beginning with verse 4. And we see how Philip goes from being a servant. Uh, some consider these to be maybe the first deacons of the church. From being a servant to being an evangelist. Look in chapter 8, beginning at verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Let me pause there. Why are they scattered? Well, if you go back a little earlier, you see the church is being persecuted by the Jews initially. Saul was part of that, who would later become Paul. It says they were scattered and they went about preaching the word. Verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. But there was a man named Simon 
who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Philip was willing to serve in all circumstances. He served what some might consider a menial task in Jerusalem that could have divided the church had it not been addressed. And now he has gone and left Jerusalem and gone to Samaria. Persecution had hit the church and many were leaving Jerusalem. Now why did he go to Samaria? He could have gone to a lot of places. Samaria is not a place where you'd find someone who had a Jewish upbringing would want to go. Because the Samaritans and the Jews hated each other. So why would Philip venture to Samaria when he got, could have gone to Galilee or some other location? Perhaps Philip was acquainted with or heard some of the stories from the apostles themselves of how Jesus went to Samaria and met people like the woman at the well and others. And he is going to follow up and share the full message of Christ now that he's been raised with those people. So he goes up to an unlikely group that could easily be avoided given his Jewish heritage and upbringing. He was even willing to risk his life like that of Stephen by going there. He was bold and courageous to share the gospel message first and foremost, even above regard for his own personal welfare. He was willing to go anywhere for the Lord's service. Philip was given the power to perform miracles by the laying on of hands of the apostles that was passed on. And he performed signs and wonders, even to the point where even this so-called great magician, Simon, was amazed. And it tells us that even he believed and was baptized as well. Now, we might not be able to go forth today and perform mind-blowing miracles like the apostles and those who laid their hands on them. But I think we can, by our actions, sincere actions in Christ and showing sincere love and consideration for others, blow some minds away by exemplifying the character of Christ in our day-to-day -day activities. Let people see that it's genuine, that it's sincere, that our words of faith, our words of praise are not just empty words, but they are who we are. And I think if people see the sincerity of that in our hearts, even though we may struggle, that we're striving sincerely to serve God and do so in love and to love other people in His name, that can be very attractive to many. But Philip did go into an area that a good Jew would not go. I wonder sometimes who might be some of the peoples or groups of peoples that we might feel we're less likely to want to go serve or share the gospel with. And maybe ask ourselves, why is that? I think there's, there's something in our nature, in our character, that it's easy to, to approach some people 
some groups of people than it is others. Some places might be easier to share the gospel than others. What's that place for you? What's that place for you? Maybe that's the place God wants you to go. Philip was a wonderful servant. And he began his evangelistic campaign by going to Samaria. But it wasn't just the miracles and his convincing words that won the day, although we need the truth of the gospel. I think it was something of who he was and his character. The fact that he was even there said something. Until people are convinced that Jesus is the great power, they're going to believe that something or someone else is. And it might be God wants to use you to help share with someone the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can have power in our testimony. We can have power in our arguments. We can have power in our very life to help others be convinced to come to know the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ because our power comes from Him. Greater is He that is in me than He that's in the world. Turn over a page or two to Acts chapter 8. Philip continues in his evangelistic campaign here. Acts chapter 8, again, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. <clears throat> and the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water, what prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotos, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. God instructs Philip to leave Samaria. He's got a thriving ministry going on in Samaria. Many are coming to believe in the Lord or being baptized, accepting the message of God. And he's told to leave a thriving ministry. To head back in the direction of Jerusalem, because the road from Jerusalem to Gaza is actually south, southwest of Jerusalem. So now he's got to go back to the very vicinity and area where all the persecutions taken place. Come 
Kind of makes you wonder if maybe it crossed Philip's mind, like it might ours. It doesn't seem to make sense. Everything's going real well right here. It's thriving. The, the word's getting out. People are accepting. But when Philip was told to go, he went. Even though he didn't fully understand where he was going or who he might encounter or what the whole plan was, he had faith to believe that God had the plan already in mind. He went, leaving what seemed to be a thriving ministry. I think we need to be like that sometimes too. As God leads us, we may not have a full understanding of what he has in mind for the location he sends. But if he says go, will we go? We, we like to plan things out and try to have everything in mind and step-by-step -step plan and so forth. And to some degree that's okay as long as we're asking God's blessing upon it. And he's in it. But sometimes we don't see the whole picture. And if God says, go, go. Go in faith that God has the greater picture in mind. And he'll use you by showing forth your faithfulness. <laughs> Philip had shared Christ with the Samaritans who hated Jews. Now he encounters another foreigner, this Ethiopian, a eunuch of some position from the queen who had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Now that indicates to me that he was a Jew. He was maybe a proselyte, a convert to Judaism, and he had gone to Jerusalem to worship. But there's a problem. This man would not be allowed to enter the temple courts because he was a eunuch, according to the custom and laws of the Jews. He could go to synagogue, but he could not go to the one place that was considered the centerpiece to worship God among the Jews. He had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was denied access to the one place of worship that was most precious to the very people he was a part of. Kind of makes you wonder if he felt rejected. And he's reading from the prophet Isaiah in his chariot. Now, I just feel certain that when he went to Jerusalem, that maybe he used some of the funds to buy that scroll. They're very costly. It's not like today you just have portions of scripture anywhere you look around. And as I learned from a, a study with some of you not long ago, the average home among our fellowship here has at least 10 Bibles. They're not that plentiful back then. They're very costly. So he has this prophet of Isaiah, and he's reading it on his return, maybe wanting to take something of God's word back to his people in Ethiopia to share some blessings from God. And he's reading it, and he's told, Philip is told by the Spirit, go up by that chariot and stay by it. Philip still doesn't know for sure what the deal is. So he goes up by the chariot. Now, wouldn't that be kind of odd? Here's a total stranger walking alongside, keeping up with you in your chariot, and you don't even know who it is. If a total stranger came up along your side and just kept pace with you, wouldn't you consider that kind of an awkward situation? What's this person doing? You make a turn, they turn. You ever had that feeling someone was shadowing you? Kind of an awkward, unusual situation. Philip probably is still wondering what's going on. Have you ever been in a situation like that where maybe in serving God you felt like you were in an awkward, unusual situation? God's got you there for a reason, but maybe you're not sure what it is yet. But you go until it's revealed to you. 
And the man was reading from Isaiah, and we read the text that he was reading from, and I think at that point, Philip knew why he was there. When he heard the man reading from Isaiah, a prophecy about the Messiah. And from that text, he shared Jesus with him. From that text, and perhaps others, but starting with that text, and then this man sees water and wants to be baptized. You see, the Old Testament, too, has the power of salvation for people. This man was brought to know the Lord Jesus Christ through the Old Testament scriptures. It can be particularly useful for those of a Jewish background or heritage. And he's baptized. Philip asked a question. When he heard him reading from Isaiah, he asked a simple question. Do you understand what you're reading? A single question launches him into an opportunity to share Christ with him. A simple question. Questions can be very useful tools. Questions help us understand where are they in their understanding? Where are they spiritually so that I can help them take the next step? Can you simply ask a question of someone? Do you understand what you're reading? And even if you're not entirely sure yourself, you can say, you know, let's, let's investigate this together and find the answer. Help someone to understand, and you may see your own understanding grow and mature as well in the process. Quite a situation. Simply ask the question. It can be very important when we encounter people. If you, if you are attuned and see people maybe in the Word, or you see people giving indications of some interest in spiritual matters, just ask a simple question can maybe launch you into an opportunity to give your testimony and share Christ. God has probably sent you there for such a purpose. Be prepared for it. Be prepared for it. Now this eunuch, when he went to worship, Probably felt rejected, as I mentioned. I can't help but think, if you look in Isaiah 56, just a couple of chapters over from where he was reading. Beginning with verse 3, Philip could use this text and it would really personalize it for this particular person. Look what it says just a couple of chapters later. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me, and hold fast my covenant. I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. I can't help but think Peter, or Philip started with the passage that he was reading, but just two or three chapters later, Philip could very well have used that text to remind the eunuch that he is precious in God's eyes. That God has not rejected him, even though he may have felt rejected and the Jews wouldn't even let go of the temple. The 
was convinced. And they stopped. And he was baptized. And he went on his way rejoicing. Now I can't speak for you, but I know every time I've witnessed a baptism, it's a celebration time. Isn't that a time of rejoicing? Amen. Isn't that a wonderful time of rejoicing? I get goosebumps just thinking about it. When I witness it, I get I get that, I don't know what I don't even know what you call the feeling. The warm fuzzies? The goosebumps, the shivers, the excitement. And sometimes I'm reminded of the day that I accepted the Lord and was covered in the blood. I get excited. It's a time to celebrate. He went on his way rejoicing. And I think Philip did too. And the Lord wasn't done with him and sent him to other locations to minister. We need to keep in step with the Spirit. Philip was moved by the Spirit. He was prompted by the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. And if we keep in step with the Spirit, it won't matter what we're called to do because we're with Him in it. Even if we don't fully understand what it is at the outset. I want you to watch this video. <sighs> okay, you can do this, Brad. Just do it like the guy said. Don't make a scene. Be quick. You're in, you're out. No one's going to notice. Okay, sir. Get it together, man. You can do this. Wait, is he looking at me? Why is he looking at me? Hey, man. Can I use that for a second? What? Your pin. Oh, the pin. <laughs> Back out now, man. Just do it. Uh, how can I help you? Just need to make a deposit. Okay. mistake i'm unarmed sir i'm gonna have to ask you to quiet down no, no, it was just an invitation to church calm down sir i will tase you we're having a potluck, we're having a potluck. <laughs> inviting someone to church doesn't have to be like robbing a bank just ask like Philip. We want people to be restored in their relationship to God. We all have a message to share, a testimony to give. It's worth the risk to see lives change for the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you want that kind of power in your life? Do you want God to use you as an instrument that His power, the power of salvation, can be revealed into the life of someone else that they can come to know Him, that they can be baptized, that they can go forth rejoicing to. Or maybe you need that kind of power in your life. It's available. It's available. The same message that Philip preaches, we preach. We preach about the suffering Messiah and servant, as Isaiah foretold 700 and some years before the event. We preach the same message. That power is available for all of us. So as the team comes forward, let me just mention this as we consider that. How do we get a hold of that power in the first place? That great power that is Jesus. We've got to accept 
who he is. We've got to acknowledge who we are, which is a sinner, <coughs> that we are sinners. And we've got to realize we need to make a change. We've got to repent and make a change in direction and follow him, that he is the great power that can overcome all the sin debt that we have. And believe in that and confess that. And just like this eunuch and the others in Samaria, they were baptized and covered in the blood, and they went on their way rejoicing, serving, and sharing the message of Christ. Now, I can't say for certain what this unit did when he got back to Ethiopia. But I do know this. Over the next century or two, there wound up being a large Christian influence in that part of Eastern Africa. I can't help but think that he took the message of Christ with him to that continent. He went where God sent him. You know, sometimes God sends you into the paths of certain people and it might even be certain peoples that maybe you feel a little awkward or uncomfortable with. It might be those groups that you just have resisted the willingness to share Christ with for some reason. But he sends you. Go, even though you don't know the whole picture. Share from his word. That's the power for salvation. What decision do you need to make? Be a Christian brother or sister that goes. That you are an active participant and not just a spectator.